Welcome, everyone. My name is Martin Jean. I'm director of the Institute of Sacred Music at Yale University. We are an interdisciplinary graduate center here at Yale for the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the related arts. This four part webinar series is meant to create a space for education about and reflection on the toll this global pandemic has had on our lives, particularly in ways that our lives and the lives of those around us end. Virtually all of our practices around the process of dying and the memorialization, memorialization of our dead have had to change. We are only just now coming to terms with this impact. We are blessed to be convened in these sessions by Dr. Thomas Long, who is the Bandy Professor Emeritus of Preaching at the Candler School of Theology at Emory University and author of the book, Accompanying, Accompany Them with Singing, The Christian Funeral. He will introduce our topic for us today in a moment, as well as all of our panelists who join us. And toward the end of the session, uh, you'll be cued uh, to, to note that there is a, a Q&A function in Zoom, uh, allowing you to send your comments and questions along to the panelists, uh, which we will, uh, some of which we'll be able to get to in the in the second part of our session. And finally, you can follow uh, some of the more of the details about this session at our website at ism.yale.edu. More to come from me, but now, without further ado, here's Dr. Thomas Long. Thanks, Martin. I'm Tom Long and privileged to uh, moderate these webinars. Uh, the last time we met as a webinar, we talked about uh, practices around accompanying those who are dying. We talked about hospice. We talked about words of comfort and rituals and deeds of care for those who are in the actual process of dying. Today, we want to talk about accompanying the dead. That is to say, we want to think about funerals and memorial services and other rituals that are done uh, around the event of death and with the dead. Uh, just to sort of set a little framework for our conversation this afternoon, I want very briefly to talk about two images that I think are important in accompanying the dead. The first image is the journey, the journey. Uh, whenever someone dies among the living, uh, the body of the one who has died must be moved and fairly quickly from the place where they have died to the place of disposition, to the grave, to the fire, to the sea, uh, to the mountain. No, no society that we know anything about has ever allowed the bodies of the dead to remain among the living. For reasons of sanitation or sanctity, the body is moved. But no society has ever regarded this task of moving the body as perfunctory, as taking out the garbage. Uh, every society recognizes that in tenderly bearing the body of the one who has died from here to there, we are engaged in a, in a deeply human and a, in some ways a, a sacred task. Now, the interesting thing is that from an anthropological perspective, this movement of the body from here to there is the funeral. Now, sometimes we think about a funeral, of course, as what goes on in a chapel at a funeral home or a Masonic hall or a church or a mosque or, or a synagogue. But as a matter of fact, when you get down to human basics, it's carrying the body from the place of death to the place of farewell that does constitute the funeral. If you've ever seen a New Orleans jazz funeral or if you watch on the news and see funerals from the Mideast, uh, you will see people carrying the body. It's a processional. Uh, and uh, they are among the noisiest of human uh, rituals across the globe. Uh, and they always involve uh, a journey. 
Thomas Lynch, the funeral director who's written about this, says that a good funeral gets the dead where they need to go and the living where they need to be. Uh, if you look at the old prayer books, for example, in the Anglican or Episcopal tradition, look at the Book of Common Prayer from 200 years ago, and it becomes clear that it was never intended that the funeral be inside a building. Uh, as a matter of fact, the rubrics state that the priest shall meet the procession and the corpse at the gate to the churchyard and then accompany them to the graveside where the service shall proceed. Uh, the only way that the funeral ever got inside the building was just to stay out of the weather for the hymns and the prayers and the, and the homilies. Uh, the main thing is the movement, the procession. Now in our society today, a lot of families when they lose a loved one will say no service whatsoever. We don't want any kind of a funeral, no, no memorial service, no ritualization whatsoever. They can do that, of course, but as a matter of fact, every human being will have a funeral because every human being, when they die, will be moved from here to there. And the question becomes, who's there? What is said? What is sung? What is done? Or what is not said? What is not sung? Uh, what is not done? And in all of these journey rituals, at the end of the ritual, when you get to the grave or the fire or the sea, there is a part of the ritual that lets the dead go, that says farewell to them. It's not closure exactly because uh, most human beings believe the dead have a future and they're being given into that future, but there is a release, uh, a letting go. You may have seen in the news how upsetting it is in India uh, in the last few weeks, how the bodies of those who have died of COVID have been washing up on the banks of the Ganges River. The reason for that is that wood is very expensive in India today and poor families cannot do what is the custom that is to build a funeral pyre to cremate the dead and put the ashes in the river. And so they do the next best thing they know to do. They simply put the bodies into the river and hope that the river, the holy river, will take the bodies where they need to, to go. And when they wash up downstream, it's not only upsetting in the physically horrifying sense of it, it's also upsetting in the incompletion of the journey. It's as if the journey didn't finish. And that leads me to the second image I want to suggest today, and that's the incomplete journey. It's a powerful image that's taking place in our society today. Uh, several years ago, uh, a young man, 17 years old, who lives near where I do in rural Maryland, was coming home in his pickup truck from a night out, and he made the turn into his lane but he swung a little wide and the front wheel of the truck went over into a ditch, the truck overturned and he was killed right on the spot instantly. Within a few days, uh, a makeshift wooden cross went up and also some other objects, a, a welder's helmet, uh, some stuffed animals, um, some jewels, uh, uh, costume jewelry was placed on the, on the cross. Um, it was a, a shrine really to the incomplete journey, to the place where the journey was interrupted. Um, over time, the objects have changed. Uh, the stuffed animals have disappeared and statues of angels have appeared. Uh, uh, a battery operated string of lavender lights now drapes over the cross. But that's been going on now for over 15 years. And it's almost as if it's a funeral that can't end. Uh, it's a journey that can't be completed. And you've seen the shrines on the highways. They are proliferating. Highway departments don't know what to do with them. Uh, when do you take them down? And what do you do with the objects so that you don't commit an act of desecration? But they are the signs of the incomplete journey. COVID has underscored this. How many of the 600,000 who have died have been accompanied to the crematorium or the cemetery by only a few in the family and maybe a funeral director. Uh, and the rest of us cannot go. And the ritual cannot uh, end. And one of the challenges that 
faces us post COVID is how do we help uh, families accompany their dead all the way to the end of the journey? Uh, how do we complete this interrupted and incomplete journey? We've got a wonderful panel here today to help us think through issues about memorialization and ritualization. Uh, I'm going to introduce each one of them as they speak. They'll speak for a few minutes and then we'll engage in some cross conversation among them. And when they do, uh, remember that you've got a question and answer button where you can ask questions or make comments as well. And Martin's gonna monitor those and uh, bring those into our conversation. Our first panelist is John Haran, and he is the president of Haran and McConaughey Funeral Homes and Cremation Service in the Denver, Colorado area. Uh, this funeral home has seven of the Denver metropolitan area, and they serve more families in Denver than any other family operated funeral service. John's been on the board of hospice and he has served as the president of a very uh, select organization, the Independent Selected Funeral Homes, which has higher ethical standards and standards of practice than the normal industry standard. He's a wise funeral director, he's innovative, he's compassionate. I, I think about him every time I see that farmer's insurance commercial because he knows a thing or two because he's seen a thing or two. Uh, John. Help us out. Thank you, Tom. That's one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. I, I, wish, I wish my wife could hear it. <laughs> well, I've been a funeral director for almost 45 years. And uh, over that time, I've seen some pretty tremendous changes in funerals and how we say goodbye. I've observed a profound shift from services that were predominantly religious driven to services that are increasingly driven by memories and relationships. Sometimes with the spiritual aspect, sometimes not. The direct and meaningful goodbyes of the past are being increasingly replaced by services that today we call celebrations. Just yesterday, I met with the widow of a man who had been ambushed and murdered. And I could see she was torn by what her progressive mindset wanted and what her heart and gut truly needed. How do we resolve the two when we are disinclined to observe the traditions that have guided grieving people for thousands of years? And how do we pretend to celebrate when the gut-wrenching shock and pain of a loved, of a loved one's death is fresh and our wounds are laid open. I've learned that the depth of love for someone is proportionate to the need to grieve when that person dies. And no matter what people are inclined to believe, what will never change is the need to cope with the pain of grief and meaningfully say goodbye in order to move forward. These past 15 months have made it difficult for people to say goodbye and to achieve meaningful closure. Thankfully, we're mostly on the other side of the pandemic. But looking back, millions of families across the country were denied opportunities to lean toward their feelings. These people were forced to postpone their, group, their grief. And Tom, I like your expression, the incomplete journey. Some had small socially distanced gatherings some chose to wait and have a service or decided that under the circumstances, a service wasn't possible. It's been said that grief denied is grief delayed. I remember hearing a minister open his homily by thanking the family for bringing their family member to church, the deceased family member to church in a casket. And he acknowledged that grief is a hard thing but his experience was that grief was shorter and ultimately easier for those who do hard things now, hard things like opening ourselves to the presence of the deceased and the support of others. He then described grief as being like a heat seeking missile that we can attempt to dodge it, but it always circles back. And a formal survey among my coworkers reveals that among those families who indicated they would come back for a service later when all could attend, only about one fifth 
have done so or have expressed a desire to do so. I can almost hear the discussions among most of these families. Why would we want to open old wounds? At this point, who would come? That brings me to my point. There are a lot of walking wounded among us. The families who told us they would hold a memorial service later have for the most part fallen back into their routines with reluctance to open what they perceive to be old wounds. But are these wounds old and have these people genuinely moved on? Perhaps in some cases, yes. Everyone's grief is different. But I've no doubt that there are millions of people who needed to say goodbye and today feel there's something profoundly incomplete in their lives. Some won't understand why they aren't sleeping well, why they take short breaths, why they sigh, why they, why they might be abusing alcohol and pharmaceuticals or why they can't seem to be the person they were before the death of a loved one. For those who are members of the clergy, I encourage you to reach out to people in your congregation or people that, you, that, that you're otherwise in contact with because I know there are a lot of hospice chaplains here. Um, those who reach out to those who experienced the death of someone close this last year. There's still an opportunity to gather and say goodbye. At this point, it would probably be less emotional, but opportunities exist to encourage people who are denied the support of their families and friends to come together with our support, to say goodbye, to receive the support of their family and friends, to remember the person they loved with laughter and tears. Acknowledging the famous book by this name, I believe our cheese has moved. The changes we experienced this last year will in many ways be lasting changes. Technology evolved and public acceptance increased. For example, video streaming, what we're experiencing right now. In our facilities, we added the ability to not only broadcast the service, but to make the presence of people attending online interactive. We're now able to invite those viewing online to raise their hand and share memories or eulogies audiovisually. We saw public acceptance of this form of technology skyrocket this last year. We had offered this prior to the pandemic, but it was rarely chosen. During the pandemic, we video streamed services almost every day. Think of how the world has changed. People now successfully work from home in unprecedented numbers. Airlines predict business travel may never go back to the levels that existed prior to the pandemic. Today, Zoom, Facebook Live, Microsoft Teams, WebEx, and other platforms have become part of our daily lives, even part of our culture. This all leads to a new paradigm for how we serve, how we minister, how we cope with some of the most difficult times of life, including how we say goodbye. The application of this technology isn't going away. Despite the fact people can gather these days, we continue to stream services. Despite the fact that there are no restrictions. Family members and friends who years ago would have flown or drove in for the services are now attending virtually from their homes. I know I share the conviction of probably everyone attending this program today that there's no substitute for direct presence. I think about the authentic and direct benefit of a hug, of holding someone's hand and listening intently as they speak, of looking into the face of someone we love who has died. Sadly, I see the fabric that weaves our hearts together as a community coping with grief being torn. Sometimes our presence from a distance is the best we can do and it's certainly better than nothing. But somehow, we have to teach and encourage people in our communities that the best way to go toward these painful and difficult times is to be personally present whenever possible. Still, our new reality is increasingly challenging us to be present to the changed mindset of people whose lives were changed by the pandemic. Our ministries must find a suitable balance between the virtual and the physical. The public is demanding it. Our work and the work of mourning are like landing airplanes. We don't get a second chance to do this well. Thank you.
Thanks, John. Um, your comment about how few people uh, actually follow through on finishing the ritual when they, they know in their bones they want to come back and do a memorial service when they can, but then they don't. Um, strikes me as um, part of the challenge for us is to take those places where we still do have paths in the forest, like All Saints Day, um, where there's a kind of community uh, commitment to the completion of a ritual and to use that in a very powerful way in these coming uh, years as we move out of the out of the pandemic. Also, I was intrigued by your comments about the use of video and uh, distance participation in funerals. And I think we're kind of on a big shakedown cruise about that, trying to learn what the best practices are. And I'm glad that people like you are helping to think that through. Those of you who were present for the first webinar will know uh, James Abington. He is a professor of church music and worship at Candler School of Theology at Emory, treasured colleague of mine when I was on that faculty. And he is uh, an international expert in the African-American church music repertoire and the editor of a major music series in that uh, musical genre with GIA publications. Uh, Jimmy, we're glad to have you uh, with us today. Thank you, Tom, and thank you so much to uh, the Yale ISM for inviting me. And John, thank you for those wonderful and encouraging remarks. <clears throat> Years ago, I knew of a church that had a one-size-fits-all order of service for funerals. It didn't matter who passed away, member, non-member, Christian, non-Christian, believer, non-believer, young or old, the program would consist of the following. The processional, flee as a bird. The opening hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. The Lord's Prayer, the 23rd Psalm, the obituary, the solo, precious Lord, take my hand, the eulogy, and the recessional, when we all get to heaven. That was it. Any additional elements were non-negotiable, the template was set. It had been ratified and approved by the church's Congress, Senate, Supreme Court, pastor, and the church secretary from years gone by. While this seems insensitive, antiquated, and out of date, there are churches that approach these services with a set of limited pericope of scriptures, hymns, and other musical selections. Now to the far extreme of that are those families who declare and insist that their loved ones are not like anyone else and should not have the same traditional church service. Therefore, their requests are for the favorite songs of the loved ones, just a few. I did it my way up, up and away, somewhere over the rainbow, drown in my own tears. My Homie by Rich Homie Quine, Dead and Gone by M.O.P., Six Feet Deep by the Ghetto Boys, Will Always Love You Papa by The Locks, to name a few. These musical requests are often accompanied by decisions to memorialize the dead by dressing them in their favorite dress, suit, jewelry, shoes, cap, hats, liturgical vestments, choir robes, church or civic uniforms, sorority or fraternity, colors or paraphernalia, and the singing of those sorority and fraternity hymns or the college alma mater and so on and so forth. Families often produce a written document for the pre-planned services of the deceased that include specific hymns, choral selections, soloist, scripture readings, readings of their favorite poetry, photographs and artwork, the playing or singing of their own original musical compositions, and pre-recorded videos of their letters written by, uh, by, written by them and recorded in many cases by them. A tradition to which I was introduced at my church in Atlanta 
was the organ medley, which immediately followed the eulogy and preceded the benediction and recessional. I believe that practice was established by my late Morehouse professor, who was the organist of the church before he passed. The organ medley consisted of usually three short hymns submitted by the family, which were their favorites or favorites of the deceased or simply the organist's choice. It was said that this medley was inserted in the service to give the family an opportunity for final moments of meditation and reflection before leaving the sanctuary. COVID ended and restricted so many of these traditions, norms, practices, and uh, requests. In Atlanta, immediately after the shutdown for the pandemic, there were two options for burial, direct cremation or short 15 to 20 minute graveside services for the family or selected guest who wore masks and were physically distanced. These graveside services usually included a brief reading of scripture, prayer, obituary, words of comfort, and perhaps an a cappella solo or an audio selection played on a technical device. While much of this has been relaxed now and many churches have resumed funerals in the sanctuary, many of these old practices are returning with a few alterations. 2020 was an unfathomable year for the entire world, but for those of us in Atlanta, we experienced the loss of so many people, well known and unknown. Three of our own civil rights leaders and political giants departed this life. On March 27th, civil rights leader and political giants departed this, uh, this world one known Joseph Lowry. Reverend Lowry was a United Methodist minister and pastor and founder of the Southern Leadership Conference. And July 17th, we lost the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian, a minister, author, close friend and Lieutenant of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and advocate and founder of the leadership movement and eventually the CT Vivian Leadership Institute. And before midnight on that same day, we lost United States Representative John Lewis, an American politician, statesman, civil rights leader who served in the US House of Representatives for Georgia's fifth congressional district from 1987 until his death. Now, each one of them were memorialized in very different ways because of COVID restrictions. As John mentioned, because we were at the beginning of the pandemic, we had uh, and gone into quarantine, Reverend Lowry's service was a graveside service exclusively for the, his immediate family. A memorial service was scheduled for that following October, which was unable to be held. And this October will be his 100th birthday. And we are still waiting to see if in fact that memorial service will be held. Reverend C.T. Vivian had a small private funeral that was televised and streamed live on several formats. There were 50 members of the clergy, his family, close friends and members of the Leadership Institute and a few of the children of other civil rights leaders who wore masks and were physically distanced throughout the church. The service contained a number of video tributes and historical footage of his political struggles and accomplishments. A soloist who also served as accompanist on an electronic piano provided the music for the entire surface. Congressman Lewis, on the other hand, was memorialized over a number of days in three different cities. A military honor guard escorted his body 
for a final crossing over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, where he helped lead a march in Montgomery for voting rights in 1965. A private celebration of his life ceremony was live streamed on several uh, platforms in Troy, Alabama, where uh, he, uh, he was uh, memorialized at the Brown Chapel AME Church. He was then taken to Washington DC where his body was laid in the rotunda of the US Capitol and a small service where a few members of Congress and Senate were allowed. Nancy Pelosi introduced him as if he would speak himself, which he did, which was followed by an audio recording of him speaking, which then was followed by wonderful singing by Whitney, uh, Whitney Phipps and the reading of a poem that he had written a few days before his death, read by Morgan Freeman. He was returned to Atlanta for a final service, which was held in his home church in the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. Now, both of these services for Reverend Vivian and Congressman Lewis included scripture reading by members of the family, which has become very popular and common practice. It's not hard to imagine that that's what happens in many of these graveside funerals, which more and more people, believe it or not, who are less known and are not willing perhaps to invest in the expense involved in many of the funerals to have these very quiet, intimate, family-centered events. Finally, in January 2021, we lost the legendary Henry Hank Aaron, who was a member of my church, whose private service of about 50 people was held at Friendship here in Atlanta and seen around the world. I don't have to say much more about that occasion. You should know that his adorable wife, Billy, had very carefully selected the music for the occasion based on, on songs and music that had been very important and meaningful to them over the years. I would have to say that when thinking about a funeral, I've talked about celebrities, I've talked about big names, but everyone who is a child of God is precious in the sight of God and how we memorialize them is important and how they will be remembered. In closing, I'd like to say, I think at least four valuable lessons were learned or at least I hope were learned and will become common practice from this year of COVID as we move forward. One, everybody doesn't need to or have to speak. And there's nothing rude, disrespectful, or insensitive about strict time limits. During COVID, remarks were often done by videos and they had to be adhered to strict formats and timings or be eliminated. Two, everybody doesn't have to attend the service. Families are now preferring more intimate services and providing guest lists for the service where there are still restrictions on the number of people that can even attend sanctuary services. Many of them are delaying and foregoing repasses and majoring gathering, major gatherings where fellowship and the accompanying of the dead was generally a time that was sought out to be with the family. Thirdly, I will say things that are eternal don't have to be everlasting at the funeral or the memorial service, which means people have and are becoming more and more sensitive to the time of the services and how long people are willing to be present in these times. Finally, I would say, when we must say goodbye and memorializing our loved ones, I think people are beginning to see eternity becomes larger and larger and the things of this world have become smaller and smaller. Thank you. Um, Tom, you're muted. 
I said, thank you, Jimmy. Your experience is very rich. Um, Jennifer McBride is uh, with us. She is a deacon in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and her ministry has been largely in bereavement work. She was for many years the director of grief support and community education at Haran and McConaughey Funeral Homes in Denver. And she is uh, partially retired now, but there's an organization that she uh, founded, helped found called Heartlight Center. Uh, it's a not-for-profit offering grief support groups uh, in the Denver area and now beyond there. And she's still involved in that. Jennifer, welcome. Uh, share with us your thoughts. Thank you. I so appreciate being here. And I so appreciate being here with my, my um, colleague and someone I've described as the brother I didn't know I had, John Haran. Um, and John Haran and I had the honor and privilege, um, along with the loving support of his mother, Valerie, um, to create Heartlight Center over 20 years ago, which is a nonprofit grief support center. Um, and I'll share more about that as well, too. So thank you. Um, Tom asked me to speak from the point of view of being a celebrant. Um, which is something that I do at Haran and McConaughey Funeral Service and for the community, um, and also to talk about grief support. Um, like the Jennifer who was on on Monday, Jennifer Hollis, I am also a thanatologist, and thanatology is the study of death, grief, and bereavement. Um, so that's something that's a different word, um, but I could resonate so much with so many of the things that Jennifer Hollis shared the other day about um, music thanatology. Um, in the, so deacons in the Lutheran church are called to bring the care of the church to the world and the concerns of the world back to the church, where people who kind of stand on the fringes um, which for me has always been a, a place where I feel like I belong is in that in-between place. And in the Denver metro area, we have one of the highest percentages of people who, when asked about if they were involved in a faith tradition or spiritual organization, decided what they would check was none, N-O-N-E. -E. So we have one of the highest percentages of people who identify as nuns. Um, but we have an incredible opportunity and a challenge to help to care for those people and to help bring meaning and support when someone dies and they want to have a service, but they're not sure what they want. Um, what I hear so often is people who say, we want something spiritual, but we don't want anything religious. And then when we sit down to talk, they often do want scripture. They do want prayer. They do want some of the foundational rituals. And that's where I think we at the funeral home can also help to serve and care for those people, to help maybe bring some of that seminal language to them, back to them, and maybe in a way to turn them back toward the faith community that they maybe came from or to find a different one. This past Tuesday, I conducted a service for a gentleman who died rather suddenly. And when I sent his wife the first draft of what we had talked about on Sunday, I had a very traditional opening prayer and then the traditional prayer of commendation at the end. And I said, these are traditional versions. I can send you something else if you feel like this doesn't fit. And her reaction was, oh no, that's exactly what we need. So it was really interesting to see how those seminal words, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the Lord bless him and keep him, how those rang somewhere in her memory of her life. And I think that um, that's something that those of us who serve as celebrants can be extensions in between what happens in the funeral home and then also back to the faith communities as well. Um, it's been so important to watch during this time, even when we have, as John was talking about, abbreviated services, different kinds of services, small gatherings, things with people online, which has been very interesting to be, you know, reaching out to a, an audience that's out there that you can't see. One of the things that's been so important for services that I've conducted is for people to leave that gathering with something that is a touchstone 
something that maybe is a symbol or something that connects them to an expression of that person's life. I always like to do something where we charge those who are present to do something in that person's honor, to maybe do something that was um, connected to a passion of theirs or something that they were committed to. Because I think sometimes sending forth people with a charge of how do we carry this person's legacy on? And it's been beautiful to see that. A woman who was a pilot and we sent everyone off with a, a heart with wings and that was tied with a ribbon that was her favorite color. Um, to have something that links them to that person. So that's some things about serving as a celebrant. Um, so much of, of what I have done in the past 25 years is walk along with grieving people. And I think about that phrase that so many of us grew up with about don't just stand there, do something. And I think a lot of what is so important in grief support is don't just do something, stand there or sit there being willing to be that non-anxious presence in an anxious situation, that sometimes leaving space for words that did not have a space to be spoken into um, is very, very important. The way that we process grief and loss is as different as our fingerprints. I have had people come to group days after a death occurred and one time at Heartlight Center, we had a woman who came in and said, it's been nine years, and this is the first time I've been willing to come to a group. Now, those are the extremes. They, it tends to be somewhere in the middle. But one of the things that is a gift that we have at Heartlight Center is we don't have a whole lot of rules. And I trust people to come if it's time for them. And sometimes they come, and sometimes it's too soon, and, and we leave that up to them. But Heartlight served Denver for almost 20 years, and we went very carefully once we had locked down to the thought of meeting online. I was very concerned about the issue of Zoom bombing, especially when you have a group of people who are sharing very tender and very intimate and very personal things that we be very mindful about who comes, how we admit them, if people register ahead of time. It's a little bit of the housekeeping issues, um, but that's been a very important thing. And we, we went into that very carefully, but we found that it really worked well. Um, now, some of the groups are starting to come back in person, um, but many of them will offer a hybrid version because we have people attend Heartlight Center groups from all over the country um, for some of the educational programs for professional and lay caregivers that Heartlight Center offers. We also had people from Canada and Mexico. Um, what was good about the lockdown was it extended our reach to anyone who wanted to be able to attend, which was a good thing. But the other side of that challenge is you don't have people physically present together. And like you said, John, about a hug, some of those nonverbal responses and things are much harder when everyone is in a little box than the hand on the shoulder of the person next to you or to see that someone else is moved by your story. So many people in our community are grieving, but they've not had the chance to mourn. Now our colleague and longtime friend, Dr. Ellen Wolfelt at the Center for Loss and Life Transition in Fort Collins talks about that mourning is grief gone public. That grief is our internal response and that mourning is something we do in relationship and in community with those who support us. He calls mourning our shared response to loss. It's that human need to gather, to share a meal. In my good Scandinavian family, when somebody died, we started cooking and cleaning, right? You started bring, cooking so that you could bring something over so that you could show your love through food, so that you could provide some sustenance, you could make some connection, you could let someone know that you were thinking of them with what you brought. 
Um, my older daughter is one of our funeral directors at Harana McConaughey, and she was talking to me in preparation for this gathering and said um, she saw people, especially even when it was only 10 people who could gather before saying, taking leave of someone's body. Um, and she saw that people would stay around. They'd stand on the sidewalk out in front and they'd tell stories, um, even when only a few of them could gather. It is such a natural and normal human thing when people want to connect. And I think we have a huge epidemic or a huge tidal wave of mourning that is before all of us as grief support caregivers because I think there is so much accumulated loss. Now, certainly most dramatically when someone we love dies, but people's lives have changed, their day-to-day -day life, their family structure, the way that they do their job, their connections, their so social support. One of the things that's so challenging in grief support, as I said, in an online kind, kind of thing is how do we connect with each other? Someone said, I went to a group, but it was so hard because we really couldn't have conversation with us, with each other. It, it had to be a little bit more orchestrated um, instead of just jumping in. The people had to raise their hand or they had to unmute themselves or be unmuted and those kinds of things. But I think that we can figure out how to deal with those things. And I loved listening to being part of Monday's conversation. I love how Jennifer Hollis talked about, she thought that the only way for music thanatology to work was for the person to be in the room. And that through the pandemic, because of the pandemic, that another way came to light, that something could be done with someone online, that it didn't necessarily need to be either or but that it could be both end. And I really appreciated those comments. I also, Michael, so appreciated what you talked about being mindful of ministering to the ministers. And one of the things that Heartlight Center has offered um, since the pandemic began, and if you go to heartlightcenter.org, this is my shameless plug, if you go to heartlightcenter.org, and this is truly because you can offer these options, these programs to anyone in your communities because they are also available online. Heartlight has offered a monthly healthcare worker and professional support group um, because there's the applause and there's the food that's brought and those kinds of things. But being with people who are walking a similar walk and can understand the challenges and issues um, and having a safe place. Um, and my successor at Heartlight is a woman named Jennifer Flom, who came from 10 years of hospice, um, professional hospice work. And she knows that community and Heartlight has brought incredible gifts to that community. I agree with you, um, Tom, about All Saints Day. I think there is an incredible opportunity in faith communities to come up to be able to reinvigorate what that, what that gathering is about and about saying those names and about writing those names and about remembering those people. I loved it the first time someone took that word apart for me, that when we remember those whom we've loved, we make them a member of us again. And how much that meant to the wife of John on Tuesday, whose service we had, when all of friend, friends of his got up and they talked about the stories and they talked about John's life of love and laughter, his legacy of caring and inviting people in, um, if that was amazing. I also want to call your attention to the fact that Heartlight Center has something called Facing the Morning, which is a four week kinesthetic experience that involves writing letters, building memorials, journaling, and then setting goals with milestones. And I just share that with you as an example. There are many things out there, but I think there's incredible opportunities to reach into our communities to gather those who need grief support who may not necessarily have known they needed it, but it is an opportunity for us to care for them, to invite them 
Um, I was reading something this morning about the example in a Japanese culture of when things are broken, to put them back together and then to highlight them with gold, that we are even more beautiful through the challenges and the things that maybe look like fractures in us, but to call attention to the growth that comes through those very difficult times. I love how Alan Wofel talks about that grief denied is grief delayed. It doesn't go away. About one of the people in one of our groups that says, if you don't deal with the grief, it will deal with you. And I think some of the best care that we can give to people is whether it's a few days after or it's nine years later, that we welcome all who need those things. There are incredible websites like What's Your Grief, Modern Loss, um, again, Dr. Wofeld Center for Loss and Life Transition. There are some incredible um, resources online and within our communities. Um, and I'm also open if anyone ever wants to reach out to me to be able to share some of those kinds of resources as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, one of the things that you said reminds me that at every funeral or memorial service, there is more than just the single death being memorialized. There are memories of those who have gone before their anticipated deaths. There, it's not just Elizabeth Smith's funeral, but uh, there are, are others who are in our awareness. And I wonder if COVID is going to in, uh, increase that. Uh, and as those of us who lead services, we might want to make them porous to um, memories and uh, grieving that is even larger than the one grief that we are having about the person whose service it is. And Our also, final panelist is Michael. Uh, Jennifer, were you going to respond? No, to that? I was just going to say that idea that every loss brings back all the other losses. And I think that's a powerful thing to be mindful of too. Tom, I'm sorry I interrupted there. No, um, no, thank you. But, I think, but I think that happens in times like this. We are reminded of things that were there that we maybe, it was not time, but now it's a time for us to deal with that. Great. Our last panelist is Michael Lewis. Uh, some of you are familiar with him from our first session. He's a parish priest at a large uh, Catholic church in El Paso, St. Mark's Catholic Church. Uh, he's on the COVID-19 ministry team of the Diocese of El Paso and has been training priests about responding to this uh, special challenge of the pandemic. Uh, Michael, we're glad to have you with us today. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to all the other great presenters today. Uh, as, as I did on Monday, I'm learning a lot today too. So thank you for, for being here. Part of my challenge is that, of course, my tradition is highly ritualistic, it's highly liturgical, and there is a, a prescribed way of doing the funeral rites. Um, uh, certainly uh, since uh, the liturgy was reformed after Vatican II, but it goes back, you know, obviously centuries before that. But the, the funeral rites that we have today um, are really threefold. There's a three stational, three moments of prayer. The first being the vigil uh, or the wake, which sort of developed out of when the, this was actually done in people's homes. Um, the, that's typically the time when the, the prayers are uh, less emphasized and the stories that Jennifer was talking about are emphasized. This is the moment to share those moments those, rem those happy memories um, to sort of have the dead be alive in the room with us as we uh, share our experiences with that person. Um, the, the second and perhaps the, the most important in our tradition is the funeral mass uh, when you know, the, the, the source and summit of our faith life is celebrated uh, specifically for the dead person. Uh, so that we can not only uh, pray with them, accompany them with our prayers, and where our hope tells us they are with the Lord, uh, but also to pray for ourselves, us mourners who are left here to mourn this person who is 
taken away from us. But it's also a, an opportunity to celebrate the communion of saints and to recognize that we are one church in heaven and on earth. And uh, though uh, this dead person's life has changed, it has not ended. Uh, and it's a reminder for us who are still here that, that there is still more to come. That's what our faith teaches us. And then the final moment of prayer would be the committal. This would be the cemetery service where uh, the remains are dust to dust, ashes to ashes. The remains are, are put into the ground or into uh, a sepulcher uh, for their eternal rest. Um, I bring up these three moments of prayer because if anything that the COVID pandemic uh, disrupted the most, it was that, it was the three, this, our, our structure of the three station funeral. And to the point where I think I speak for a lot of my brother priests, we didn't know what to do because we were not able to meet for the funeral mass. We were not, we certainly weren't able to gather the family to tell stories at the vigil. Uh, and really, at least in my diocese, we were limited to having 10 people at the grave site where one service was in, had to take the role of all of the moments of prayer in a way that it was not designed for. So it caused us a great challenge to meet this ministerial need with some creativity, but also to do so in a way that was meaningful, but not perfunctory. Because if we're limited in time, we're limited in the number of people who can participate, then that means that you really have to compress a lot into a service that wasn't intended for that role. Um, we also had to figure out ways to involve the participation of the community. And I say participation, I use that word specifically and not the attendance of the community. Because as we've discussed already in our, in, in the other presenters have mentioned this, it is a need for the family and friends of the deceased to participate in the mourning rituals so that they can feel a part of it. It's part of their grieving process to participate in these things. So when you don't even have an opportunity for them to do that, again, it's like they're not given a chance to mourn. It's their mourning has been um, cut off. And, and as we've started, or as uh, Tom began this, this entire presentation, the journey is incomplete. And it's even the, our own journey of mourning is incomplete, much less the prayers that we have for the dead. So what we've discovered sort of in our uh, community here, which uh, as I mentioned on Monday is we're all located on the border. It's very Hispanic and very Catholic. Um, so there's sort of things that are expected when a dead person, when a person dies. And we're not able to do that for months and months on end. So what we found ourselves doing is sort of reviving an, an ancient church tradition that had fallen away in sort of ways. And that's the memorial mass. So we have a memorial mass, it's part of our tradition. It's rarely used because frankly, most priests don't have the time to be praying memorial masses for every person on the, on the anniversary of their death. If we did, we would be doing what we did in centuries past where the only masses we were celebrating were memorial masses for the dead. But we're seeing that as a new opportunity to give the family, a chance to mourn appropriately, but also to do the complete sort of package of prayers for this person, to be there and offer them the funeral mass that they could not have. But at least we can offer them the sacrifice of the mass, our most holy sacrament. We can offer them to them on a day that would be significant for them. So we've found ourselves more and more suggesting this and reaching out to the families who we weren't able to celebrate the funeral masses and suggest that this be an appropriate way to, uh, to honor this person, to pray for this person, uh, but also to give ourselves the chance to mourn 
in a way that we did not get a chance to. But in all of this, we find to uh, a challenge too that, that has been brought up in, by our other panelists today about the challenge to balance our spiritual liturgy with uh, a sort of a, sec a secular ritual. And I think we all respond to a sense of ritual, even if we don't admit it. Jennifer was saying this before, you know. And so how do we meet that need too? And especially when it comes to the funerals that have happened during COVID, they're at the same time, even though we've had less people involved, they are somehow more public because of the public nature of the pandemic. And we still find a way that we've, I mean, we've always dealt with this sort of tension between um, we're here to pray for the dead, we're here to pray for other mourners, but also this is the last chance we're going to see a lot of these people inside a church again. So let me get at them, you know. But there's also the sense of the community needs to mourn. There's also the sense of the larger issue of all the people who have died. And in my community, it's close to 3,000. Of all the people who have died of this disease and of the shared experience that we all have, the shared grief that we all have from going through this together. In El Paso, which was one of the hardest hit, especially in November and December of last year, we all went through it. Uh, at one point, one in 13 people had COVID in El Paso. And that was an experience we all shared. And every single person in this community knows somebody personally who died of this disease. So offering them a chance to mourn corporately, um, that's still a challenge that we, I think, have yet to resolve. I think the other thing, uh, as I conclude here, is that one of the the biggest challenges of this pandemic is that there's no certain date to mark a lot of this. You know, you could say, well, is the date that COVID landed in America? Well, well, there was the date that maybe the, the deaths reached a certain crescendo. So that makes it also very difficult to do what we are used to doing, which is we celebrate a day. So as Tom has said, you know, the, this year and last, per, per, especially in our community, All, All Saints Day and, and our tradition, All Souls Day took on an outsized role, an outsized importance. But I would hate to minimize all the other dead by just focusing on that one day. So I'm hoping we can find a way in our community, and I'm sure in other communities, to memorialize, memorialize the dead who died during the pandemic and because of the pandemic in a way that lets us focus on them and their unique situation. Thank you, Michael. Um, one of our uh, audience participants um, reminded us in the question section about the terrible discovery in Canada this past few weeks of the mass graves at the, of children at the indigenous schools, some of these schools run by the Christian church. Um, and obviously the grief there is more than just one, one to one. Uh, it's a grief and shame over a public failure and a moral, and a moral failure. There's some of that about COVID. Um, it has divided us even more politically. Um, it has exposed uh, places where our society did not respond as it could to uh, care for people. Um, how, how much of our grief process requires us to face this honestly? How much should the social dimensions of this come into our memorialization process, do you think? Well, I, I, you know, I can, I know several times in, in when the restrictions are most rest, restrictive, um, when we were only allowed to have 10 people at the gravesite and, and everyone was supposed to be socially distanced and wearing masks, it became sort of a, a political test of wills to see how many people would show up and who would refuse to wear a mask or refuse to, to socially distant, you know. And, you know, on one hand, we're trying to uh, keep the focus on the person who has died and to recognize that grief causes us sometimes to do things we wouldn't normally do. Um, but at the same time, 
it was you know meeting that challenge of, of from my perspective inappropriateness you know of trying to push this um you know sort of political agenda in the midst of what was still a raging pandemic that was difficult to do but i have found it you know it, it's because of my personal interaction with so many COVID patients and then with the dead um i ha you know it didn't escape that it causes me to be fervently uh, pro vaccination pro hand washing pro social distancing uh, pro mask wearing uh, in in my uh, uh, even in my congregation and I'm sure if you asked any one of them they'll tell you oh yeah we know Father Mike he wants us to get vaccinated you know so but the way I look at it if one more person gets vaccinated then that's one less person I have to visit in the hospital so I consider it a win. This may be a question primarily to John, but others can respond as well. We've seen the rise of green and ecologically sound uh, funerals. Um, what's your uh, observation about uh, that trend? Uh, and has it been affected by COVID in any way? It's, it's a very slow moving trend. It gets a lot of press, but it's something that we rarely hear about, but but we, we, we used to never hear about this. So at least we, we occasionally hear about this these days. Um, the, it, I mean, insofar as the effect of, I mean, of COVID, um, I mean, I, I, I mean, people, I, I guess I can't see how that affected the ecologically minded choices that, that people make. Um, yeah. Jennifer, do you have a different perspective on that? No, I agree with you, John. I think, I think as you said, it, it, there are times where it gets a lot of press, but then when people are actually making decisions, it, it ends up, it, it doesn't have as much impact as I, yeah. it may in the future. Um, I, I want to just go back to what Stephen had written about Canada. And I just think that the, the phrase, and I don't remember who, and John, you may remember, but I think the phrase give sorrow words um, is very important. Um, the, the shock of, of, a, of a discovery of this type, I think being able to have expression to give the sorrow and the feelings behind that for there to be opportunities for expression about that. Um, and to be able to mourn, to be able to come together with others. I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll turn it over to Martin to cl close us out. Um, one of the tensions I think that people who help people memorialize death is the tension between uh, personalization of this. This is Elizabeth Smith's death. This is Elizabeth Smith's funeral. Elizabeth Smith is unlike anyone uh, else, and the funeral ought, or memorial service ought to represent that. And she is walking a path many have walked before and many will walk after, and we have accompanied many, many people along this path, and we know the way through the forest. Um, what about the, the balance between what, what we do always when someone has died and what we do especially when Elizabeth uh, has died. We pastors sometimes say to a family, what would your mother have wanted at the funeral? And it sometimes can be a panicky question because they haven't thought about that and feel like they ought to have some innovative response. They are sort of condemned to choose at that point. Um, what do you think about that balance? Uh, maybe Jennifer, I'll start with you because you you work carefully with this in your celebrant capacity. Well, oftentimes when I sit down with people, I say, first of all, there's what we're gonna do is talk about a lot of questions. The answers don't all have to be answered now. This is a process that takes time and it, it comes together. But I often say to people, what are things that you want to make sure that we do during this time? And what are things you want to make sure that we don't do? Because people have reactions of having gone to services and saying, oh, that was great. Or boy, I don't want that. Um, and, I, and I think to open those kinds of doors and to ask some open-ended questions 
um, often ends up leading to um, eventually we'll figure out what music we're going to play but finding out how they feel about this and and what's what fuels the positive and what is is challenging for them and what we should avoid I think are huge questions to start with but Tom you brought up something important and and I see it all the time <clears throat> and it's people who are you know, it, it, it sort of inclined to say, oh, you know, when I go, just get rid of me, get on with your lives and move on. And, and, and gee, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if there were some sort of a switch that, 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 that we could flip and suddenly we're over someone. But, but as I said, the degree to which we have loved is directly proportionate to, to the degree that someday perhaps we must grieve. And, um, and I saw this again yesterday with the wife of the man who died very suddenly uh, 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 murdered. And she had in her mind what, you know, that she wanted to keep everything, you know, very simple. She didn't want to see him. She started out, that, that, that's the way it started out two or three days ago. And yesterday she said to me, John, I, I, I'm now wondering if I should see him. And I can't tell you how often we hear this. And, 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 and I think in that initial shock and that, that, that initial reaction uh, where fight versus flight is so present and, and flight is so, so tempting. Um, I, we, live in, we live in a world today where flight has achieved a degree of social acceptability that in our parents' generations, we didn't see so much. Um, early in my career, I didn't see so much, but, um, but I guess obviously we had established a, a, a degree of trust so that she wanted to know how I felt about it. And, um, and I encouraged her to see him, um, that, 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 that what we know here and what we feel here can be so vastly different. And, 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 and we have to knit, knit these together. And uh, one, one, one of the uh, persons in the Q&A has asked, asked you, Tom, about the importance of viewing. And, and, and I see how we knit what we know here with what we just can't accept here, how we can bring these in, slowly start to bring these into sync. The idea that people say it'll be easier if, it'll be easier for you if you don't see him and then we disappear people and this and this are confused. One of the things that I would add to that um, in funeral homes or situations that are uh, outside of a church or a denomination or and its rituals and its um, practices those those freedoms are given a little more you know there's a little more freedom for that but there are churches that have set as I was saying in my remarks that have pretty much set some pretty strict boundaries uh, for even weddings so that's why we're not seeing as many weddings in churches as we used to people uh, the churches don't allow secular music uh, so if the church does not allow secular music, and this is a request, uh, people may choose not to have those services at the church because the church does have certain rules and regulations. And that becomes really rough at a time where, you, as you said, all of these uh, pastoral and all of these emotional uh, issues are at play. And uh, your, your hands are kind of tied because this is what the church policy is. We don't do this or we do the, that we don't open the casket or it, it must be this and uh, so there's constantly the, the tug of war between many times the funeral director and the church's policy where families have been used or want to have their services actually in the church and i think there's a danger especially coming from a rules-based uh tradition that you know we can restrict things too much so that everything becomes cookie cutter and becomes a one funeral fits all uh, sort of situation. But, you know, one of the things I always try to remind um, our, our funeral planning team 
is that you know our our funeral ritual book has 46 different type prayers depending on the circumstance of the deceased it also has dozens of options for uh, for scripture readings so we shouldn't just be well this is what i like well what is more what, that's great but what about mrs smith you know not so much what would she have wanted but what's best for her and what's best for her family who's mourning her a good remark to end on uh michael thank you for that uh, sorry we didn't get to all of the questions uh that um, some of you who are here ask, uh, but we're out of time. Martin, if you would close us. Yeah, and just to, to say that a, a few of those questions had links uh, that people sent on, and I actually pushed those out into the public sector of the Q&A, just so everyone can see them. Um, I do feel obliged to, to um, remark on the incredible tragedy this morning in Florida with the collapse of the uh, Champlain Towers. And uh, one of our guests today has encouraged us to pray for the Catholic community of St. Joseph. Of course, there's many parishes there and many community members in that, in that city who are experiencing tragedy in very real time. So our prayers and thoughts to, to all of those uh, affected by that horrible tragedy. And then also just to say thanks to all of our panelists and, and of course to Tom Long, our leader uh, today for this incredibly rich, stimulating, and uh, wide-ranging conversation around literally life and death matters. I invite you all uh, back to the third <laughs> webinar. Somebody's, <laughs> somebody's alarm just went off. Um, uh, to the third session of this webinar, which will be uh, this coming Monday, June 28th at 4, 4 p.m. again, Eastern Time. Uh, you've since you're in this webinar, you've already registered for all four, so you need not register again. You'll get a link uh, the day before and the hour before the webinar begins, just to remind you of uh, uh, of its uh, time and the link to use. And uh, without further ado, I think I'll uh, say thank you on behalf of all of us to all of you who've tuned in, and we look forward to continuing this conversation next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. So long.